Hello everyone and welcome to my channel and another video about clinical pharmacy practice. In today's video we're going to talk about infectious diseases. We have a case um, about an infection and uh, today's topic is actually about a very popular bug that we see in hospitals that you have to know how to treat uh, which is pseudomonas. Um, so pseudomonas is one of the very popular uh, hospital associated bugs. Uh, you see it a lot in hospitals. You might not hear about it a lot in community, but it is also available in the community. And um, it's one of the, I should say, one of the resistant uh, bugs that only very few antibiotics will uh, will cover and uh, be able to eradicate. And uh, some of the uh, newly emergent pseudomonas uh, bugs are actually multi-drug resistant pseudomonases. So. Uh, basically, uh, they are resistant to all the common antibiotics that we use for pseudomonas. So let's get into today's uh, video and case, and uh, um, we'll see, we'll learn more about pseudomonas today. For those of you who are new on the channel, this channel is all about clinical pharmacy practice. I teach you how to become clinical pharmacists, how to advance your career. Um, I, I also teach you how to pass the uh, pharmacist OSCE exam. And there's a whole uh, chapter about immigration to Canada. So uh, if you're interested, make sure to subscribe to the channel and activate the bell so that you get notified of my future uh, videos. Now let's get started with today's presentation. And of course, uh, today's case is a 58-year-old male patient who uh, presented to the emergency department with fever and left leg swelling. And when, when you see leg swelling, uh, unilateral um, in, uh, in the emergency department, you immediately should think about cellulitis. It could be cellulitis, it could be something else, but cellulitis should come to your mind right away. The patient uh, reported that the swelling started about three days earlier, but the fever and chills started a day before presentation. Uh, the past medical history includes hypertension and dyslipidemia. There is no history of trauma or insect bites, so he wasn't traumatized in any way. He didn't get bitten by any insect. In fact, the patient never had such leg swelling before. So this is the first time the patient presents with such a leg uh, swelling. The leg swelling was associated with throbbing pain. Um, so, when uh, if if you if like if you're enrolled in one of my uh, courses, clinical pharmacy courses, you'd know that I teach the different types of pain and how to describe them because it's very important to know um, the quality of pain and how how uh, how it feels. So this pain uh, reported throbbing uh, pain. Uh, on clinical examination, patient was alert and oriented times three. Um, he was febrile, uh, temperature was 38.2 Celsius. His blood pressure was 128 over 75, heart rate was 130, and respiratory rate was 22. Uh, from a cardiovascular perspective, which is another thing we think about when we see a leg swelling, uh, especially in heart failure patients, the patient did not have any signs and symptoms of heart failure or any cardiac abnormalities. So from physical examination, the doctor could tell that th this is not cardiac. This is something else. Ultrasound of the leg showed no evidence of DVT or osteomyelitis changes, which is something we see on ultrasound uh, initially. Um, so no DVT, which is another thing we think about when we see a leg swelling. And uh, there, there was no osteomyelitis detected on the ultrasound. Of course, ultrasound is not the typical or ideal test for osteomyelitis. Uh, there are other tests that we do, but it, uh, it gives you an idea if there is anything going on. If there are any, um, anything that, that, that is leading to osteomyelitis, uh, any bone changes. And then you can do the other uh, um, uh, specific tests. White blood count and neutrophils were elevated, so that gives us a hint that there, there may be an infection going on. The patient received a diagnosis of leg cellulitis. Okay, so it is cellulitis from the initial uh, diagnosis and physical exam. Um, from the initial physical exam, the, uh, the diagnosis was leg cellulitis. Blood samples were drawn and the patient was started on IV 
ciftriaxone, two grams Q, 24 hours. Now, why, this is a question for the audience, for you guys, why do you think um, we, uh, we drew the black blood samples and then gave the IV antibiotic? Why didn't we start IV antibiotics right away if we think that this is a cellulitis, which is an infection, basically? Why, why would you, you delay the IV antibiotics uh, when you know that this is an infection? Let me know in the comments. And if you don't know, it's okay. Just leave me a, a comment in the, uh, in the comment section to tell me that you didn't know. Tell me that you want to know the answer so that I can answer you. Uh, preliminary uh, culture results came back the next day. It takes time for cultures to come back. So this is only the preliminary uh, culture result. And it showed a gram-negative bacilli in the blood. So now we have the primary culture result. It doesn't tell you what it is, but it tells you that there is gram-negative bacilli in the blood. Bacilli means rods. Um, and the patient is on ceftriaxone. White blood count and neutrophils continued to rise on the next day and the fever did not subside. So the patient is still febrile. Um, the white blood count and neutrophils are still climbing despite starting IV ceftriaxone, which by the way should cover um, gram-negative bacilli. Uh, 48 hours later, Blood cultures showed Pseudomonas aeruginosa, two out of two sets. So, two out of two sets of blood, both of them drew Pseudomonas, um, and uh, both samples came from the blood. However, susceptibilities were still pending. So, we now we, we have a bug. We know that there is a Pseudomonas growing in the blood, but we don't have susceptibilities. We don't know which antibiotics are... Uh, good to kill that bug that we just grew out of the blood of that patient what would you do at this point now here's what I ask you and my students all the time you have to pause the video here and try to answer this question what would you do at this point try to answer the question without looking up any references first if you cannot answer the question it's okay to look up a reference but pick up the right reference don't just google it don't use dr google um so pick up a a, a a good reference this is an infectious diseases case so uh find an infectious diseases uh reference and look at it so you have a diagnosis of cellulitis which is a skin and soft tissue infection you have a bug which is pseudomonas you need to find out what's the first line treatment. And uh, first of all, you need to know whether or not we should treat that bug uh, because we don't treat all kinds of infections, by the way. So find out if, the, if, we, if this is one that we should treat, what's the first line drug, uh, dose, duration, and everything, and then leave me the answer in the comments. This is how I know that you're actually following. Um, just watching the video and knowing the answer later, uh, that's not what I want from you. I actually want you to do the research. This is exactly what I do with my students. Do the research and find the answer and then come back and watch uh, the rest of the video to make sure that you actually answered it correctly. And then at the end of the video, I have another question for you. All right, moving on to the next slide. So, susceptibility results came back uh, after 48 hours and it showed um, that this bug pseudomonas is sensitive to uh, meropenem, ceftazidim, resistant to ciprofloxacin, has intermediate susceptibility to piperacillin and tazobactam, and sensitive to genomycin. Again, I hope you picked up one of these, but if you did, uh, which one did you choose? Because out of these, um, one of them, one of them, one of the S's um, cannot be used. And then we have a resistant one, 
So this one cannot be used. So hopefully you didn't pick up this one because ciprofloxacin usually has an S next to it when it comes to this bug. But for this patient, it has an R. And this one has an I. Who knows what's if we could or couldn't use peperosan has a back down. Let me know in the comments. I'm not going to talk about it today. But this is a very interesting um, case that is um, a very interesting pseudomonas bug that has an intermediate susceptibility to peperosalin. Anyways, um, so this is what we have now. The patient is still on ceftriaxone. Now let's talk a little bit about pseudomonas infections. Um, so infections with uh, pseudomonas have become a real concern in hospital acquired infections like I said in the beginning of the video this is a very popular bug in hospitals uh, and especially in the ICU unit or even in any immunocompromised uh, patient um, the major problem leading to high mortality is probably because of the drug resistance of this pseudomonas especially the newly emergent pseudomonas uh, bugs with multi-drug resistant uh, um, um, on uh, like for example like when you see the susceptibility results you'll probably see R R R R R all of them R's resistant 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 so, so you won't you won't see any the initial susceptibility would not show you any um, antibiotic that actually can kill the pseudomonas the newly emergent uh, multi-drug resistant ones risk factors for pseudomonas we have a few risk factors for pseudomonas infections um, some of them are patients with known pseudomonas colonization so those patients have too many coloni colonies of uh, pseudomonas in their body and uh, they became colonized with pseudomonas they're living with it sometimes or, like most of the time they're not doing anything they're not infecting the patients but sometimes they can turn against the patient uh, let's say the patient injured uh, themselves the pseudomonas is already there on their body it goes into that infection and makes it worse and that's when the patient um, goes to the hospital and we see them. Um, another risk factor is prior pseudomonas infection. So when you, when you get a patient at the hospital um, with a cultures are pending um, or maybe culture grew gram negative bacilli and you look, you should look at the previous cultures like previous month in the past two, three months, did the patient have any infection? If you see pseudomonas, start a pseudomonas uh, 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 treatment right away don't wait for the cultures to come back with uh, with the result because this patient m may be having another pseudomonas infection again so prior pseudomonas infection is a risk factor for pseudomonas uh, detection of gram negative rods in the cultures or gra gram negative bacilli. Uh, hospitalization plus iv antibiotics in the last three months that's another risk factor uh, recent hospitalization or a stay in long-term care facility so older patients who uh, live in a long-term care facility have a higher risk of getting a pseudomonas infection than um, older people who live at their homes uh, like in their houses uh, recent antibiotic use whatever antibiotic it is and this is basically relative like not everyone who just recently used an antibiotic has a high risk of pseudomonas infection but it is a relative uh, risk factor and of course immunosuppression so it's important to know these risk factors because it helps you decide what to what antibiotic to use for uh, those infections as you can see here um, these are the uh, most common anti pseudomonal antibiotics and those you should know by heart I'm telling you right now, every clinical pharmacist knows these drugs by heart. If you don't know them by heart, you're not a clinical pharmacist, okay? So, what do we have here? You have the penicillins, uh, piperacillin, tezobactam, and ticarcillin clavulinate. We don't have that in Canada uh, or in the U.S. Um, oh, yeah, it says right there, not available in the U.S. or Canada. And these are the doses. So, piperacillin tezobactam has a range of doses. For those of you who've used it before, um, the most common dose is 3.375 grams IV every six hours. This is the uh, most popular, most common dose for all infections. 
uh, but when, when it comes to pseudomonas, we have to give a higher dose of 4.5 grams every six hours. And you can see here that they put this dose only. They didn't put any other doses. Of course, if the patient has a bad kidney function, you will still have to adjust the dose, lower it, or maybe change the um, dosing interval. But in general, this is the, um, the recommended dose for pseudomonas infections in patients with normal kidney function. Ciftazidime comes next, the second most popular antibiotic that we use for pseudomonas, and the, this list has cephalosporins here. So cefepim, uh, cefepirazone, and um, I don't know this drug, we don't have it too, uh, cefidurocol, all these are anti-pseudomonal cephalosporins. Asterionam is the uh, monobactam um, choice. Ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin are amongst the fluoroquine alone uh, choices. And as you can see, there is no moxifloxacin, gadifloxacin. You don't see those ones here. So only cipro and levofloxacin. And with ciprofloxacin, we usually give a higher dose than what we do with other infections. So when it comes to pseudomonas, you see that the oral dose is 750 milligrams every 12 hours. Again, that's only for normal kidney function. If the patient has a bad kidney function, you will need to adjust that dose. And for the IV, which we usually do 400 every 12 hours IV, um, here it says every eight to 12 hours. So for pseudomonas, we go with every eight hours usually, uh, unless it's pseudomonas in the urine, for example, uh, then we can do every 12 hours because we know that it will be excreted in the urine. So you don't have to go with a higher dose. From the carbapenems, we have meropenem, duropenem, emipenem, of course, emipenem with salacetin. Um, the most common ones for uh, pseudomonas from the carbapenem group. And here we have a combination. These are newer antibiotics. Uh, they are advanced beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. Uh, they may not be available in some countries. So ceftazidine with avibactam, ceftolazone with tezobactam, and emipenem with celastatin with relibactam. Uh, these are very advanced ones, and usually they are used for multidrug resistance to demonas. Uh, from the aminoglycosides, we have tobromycin, genomycin, amikacin, and plasomycin. Um, again, yes, they are anti-pseudomonal, um, but they are not commonly used for pseudomonas um, alone. So usually we add them on uh, a beta-lactam, like for example, pepperacillin tazobactam plus genomycin or ceftazidine plus tobramycin, something like that. But when you get an anti-pseudomonal, when you get a pseudomonas infection in, um, on, like on the skin or in a wound or osteomyelitis pseudomonas or uh, endocarditis pseudomonas or anything like that. We don't use these alone. Uh, pretty much aminoglycosides are only used alone if it's a urinary tract infection. Besides urinary tract, any other infection, um, they probably wouldn't be enough on their own. And finally, we have the polymyxins. So cholestin and polymyxin B. Again, these are very advanced you may not find them in your countries um, but usually reserved for multi-drug resistant uh, pseudomonas so general principles the risk of antibiotic resistance both intrinsic and acquired is an important consideration when selecting empiric or directed therapy so you need to know um, most laboratories will tell you that we have a, um, a high uh, incidence of resistance to pseudomonas. So in this case, you wouldn't go with, uh, say, genomycin or, uh, for, for empiric treatment or, let's say, pepperocell and tezobactam. You want to use those popular ones because you know there's a high incidence of uh, resistance. So you would go with a higher, uh, uh, sorry, a more advanced antibiotic selection. Monotherapy is generally adequate, although combination therapy is indicated in certain uh, high-risk patients and in severe infections. And we see that uh, usually in uh, pseudomonas pneumonia, 
um, we combine two anti pseudomonal drugs, uh, something like uh, peperacillin-tazobactam plus levofloxacin, for example, uh, if the patient is uh, immunocompromised and uh, has high risk of, uh, of uh, resistance to the monus. Uh, prompt initiation of antimicrobial therapy is important as delayed therapy correlates with increased mortality. Pseudomonas infections kill, so do not delay therapy. As soon as you um, worry, start to be concerned about a pseudomonas, even if you don't see it in front of you, start therapy right away. Recommend something to treat pseudomonas immediately. Don't wait for blood cultures or whatever cultures you have to come back with a result, start therapy, and you can always de-escalate therapy later um, by switching to another uh, narrower spectrum antibiotic. Source control is important, like with any other infection, we have to do source control. So we have to know where the infection is coming from, control the source to avoid the spread of the, uh, the seeding of the infection, for example, infected uh, catheters, for example, and other implanted uh, devices uh, should be removed. Um, abscesses should be drained if the patient presents with an abscess. And then uh, you see a spread of the infection to the blood. You have to drain the abscess and treat it. And then also at the same time, uh, treat the bloodstream infection. But as soon as you control the source of the infection, that it will be much easier to control the infection in the blood. And of course, obstructions should be relieved. Now back to our case, uh, the patient's antibiotic was switched to meropenem on the same day we uh, received the uh, gram-negative rod uh, results before we even got the pseudomonas results. And uh, we started with a 500 milligram of meropenem IV every six hours. We didn't think that this patient had a uh, multi-drug resistant uh, pseudomonas. Um, there were no risk factors. Fever stopped the next day and the patient started to feel better. And uh, of course the white blood count and neutrophils uh, normalized. Now another question to the audience. How long uh, would you treat this patient for? Now we started the meropenem, the patient got better in two days. What do you do now? How long would you treat this patient for? And would you keep them in hospital or discharge them home on oral antibiotics? That's a very important question because in hospitals, usually management in the hospital, um, the hospital managers push doctors and pharmacists to discharge patients, get them out of the hospital as soon as possible because there are many other patients waiting to get into the hospital. So we have to, um, we have to have beds to uh, receive the new patients. Um, and, and the only way to do that is by discharging the patients that don't have uh, severe uh, problems and uh, don't need lots and lots of hospital care. And in this case, it's just cellulitis, so that's an easy case. Uh, we can push him home and uh, have him treated as an outpatient, we call it, like outside of the hospital. But what would you do? Would you keep this patient in the hospital, specifically this patient, or would you discharge them home? And which oral antibiotic would you, would you uh, discharge them on if you would discharge them? Or do you have another plan? Actually, I'm gonna add another question. And what do you think about ertapenem? There's another meropenem, ertapenem, that is used only once daily. Um, the dose is one gram once daily. Would you discharge the patient, for example, to the outpatient IV program on an erdipenem one gram once daily? Would that be a solution? Uh, so for those of you who don't know the outpatient IV program, this is a program that enables patients to get their IV uh, antibiotics um, at the hospital, but in a clinic, like an outpatient clinic, that only works for um, IV antibiotics. So they only, only do that. The patient goes there, they hang the, uh, they have chairs, they hang the antibiotic for the patient for an hour or two, whatever it takes, and then the patient goes home. And then the next day, it's the same thing. So you, you can do it once or twice a day, uh, usually. Uh, they accept once, twice, or even three times a day sometimes. Um, and it's available uh, for, to, to facilitate discharging patients out of the hospital so what do you think? I gave you too many options now. 
what would you do with this patient? Let me know in the comments. And this is all for, uh, for today about um, infectious diseases. And I'll see you soon. I'm preparing a few other videos and a few other cases in uh, clinical pharmacy. So I'll see you soon in another video. Thanks for watching and have a great day.